Why does Maz Kanata have, have Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber? Why? Maz promises to someday tell the story of how she acquired it. Oh, thank you, book. Why don't you tell it now? Now that you have a book with all this little information, how about you tell me now? What's up, guys? It's your boy Vito. Hope you're doing all right. One of these days, one of these days, I'm gonna commit to that YouTuber voice, man. Every video is just gonna be like, "Who oh, help? You're having a good day here on YouTube." Here's the deal. I'm working on my big Rise of Skywalker review. People keep saying, "When are we getting Rise of Skywalker?" A complete cinematic failure. Well, the answer is in March. Hopefully, the DVD comes out end of March, and I will be. Grabbing the DVD Blu-ray pulling scenes directly so you have the crispest examples of why that movie is a nightmare. I'm really going to do a deep dive review to the point that I have picked up what is... This is an embarrassing uh, thing that Disney and whoever else put together. This is the official Rise of Skywalker visual dictionary. Now this book is full of some truly hilarious retcons, which I cannot wait to share with you guys. There is... Some stuff in here which I think just further puts the nail in that Star Wars coffin. But before we get into it, real quick, I want to give a shout out to one of the most intense mobile MMOs I've ever played in my life. You know it and I know it and we all love it. It's called Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is an awesome dark fantasy RPG that is free to play on your PC or mobile device. It looks fantastic no matter what you're playing it on, and it is a true thrill to unlock and upgrade new champions. Especially now, as the highly anticipated Battle Pass Season 1 is alive, letting players win awesome rewards including free energy refills, gems, upgraded artifact sets, and new epic and legendary champions. I venture that you'd be a fool to not download the game today. Use the link in my description box and you're gonna get yourself a hundred thousand silver and a brand new champion, the Hexweaver. Look at this thing. My God, that sh that'll kill you dead. You're gonna die. All that treasure will be waiting in your inbox for the next 30 days. Again, check the link in the description. You don't wanna miss out on Raid Shadow Legends. Beautiful game. It's an attractive looking book, to be fair. Hardcover, inside, all sorts of interesting information about uh, every minor character. You even get to see all these people who are in the background. Look at Scary Teeth Man. Very interesting stuff. If I was a, you know, eight-year-old boy, I'd probably love the heck out of this book. But uh, I'm not. I'm not a tiny child who is just easily amused by Star Wars information. I'm going through the book going, please tell me what was going on in that movie. Can, can you explain some, some of this nonsense? Palpatine's back. There's a dyad in the force. None of this. Why? Will you tell me what's going on? Book, do you have the answers? And I regret to inform you that uh, not only does this book not have answers, which we will get into, it has some just embarrassing contradictions, retcons, and I feel bad for the guy who wrote it, this Pablo Hidalgo guy, who apparently has been with Star Wars for a while. He's done a lot of the background material and is obviously now part of the Lucasfilm Story Group. It's, it seems like his job was to, to go through the sequel trilogy and all the stuff that doesn't make any sense, it seems like it was his job to make up reasons why it could make sense. It's hard to say exactly what's going on without without giving examples, so we'll get right into it. But but I do want to say, I think Pablo Hidalgo, you had an impossible job taking these horrible movies and being like, well, actually, uh, space time was bending, and that's the reason. No, there's no way to make it work. It's hilarious what we ended up with. Let's take a look at some of the nonsense that is in this book. Number one, Star Killer Base is magic. All right, now, part of this book covers the ground from the first two movies, kind of trying to catch you up on the plot, while also offering explanations for things that are kind of just clearly ridiculous. 
explanations where you're like, okay, J.J. Abrams did not actually think this through. This is you after the fact having to come up with an explanation for either J.J. Abrams or Ryan Johnson's failures of writing. So as we all remember, in The Force Awakens, Starkiller base, the big old laser base. Ooh, the Death Star's a planet now. Gotta have another Death Star. And it's bigger than the last Death Star, whereas the Death Star could only blow up one planet. This can blow up all the planets at once. J.J. Abrams just takes ideas other people had and makes them bigger. You thought one Star Destroyer was scary. What about a billion Star Destroyers? Jeez, come on, J.J., come up with some ideas. Okay, but the question we had here was, wouldn't building a giant laser into a planet be worse than a Death Star? Because the Death Star, was it was a space station. It could theoretically move through space. You know, like if there's a planet you want to destroy, you float the Death Star over to that planet and blow it up. But Starkiller Base should only be able to hit whatever is, you know, within range of that planet. You can't really move a planet, or at least not very easily that we know of. So one, why build it into a planet if you're limited in what you can hit? Two, how do you not see that they're building a laser in the middle of, you know, because again, it needs to be within range of what it's going to shoot. How do you not notice? Hey, those guys are building a laser like right over there. We should probably deal with that. And three, uh, how is it that these planets get blown up, but then other planets like can see it? Like if the First Order blew up the Hosnian system, why is Finn and Han Solo able to see it from Maz Kanata's planet? Are they in the Hosnian system? Like, how do, how do they know that this happened? If you can look up and see the laser, doesn't that mean you're right next to the frickin' laser base? Okay, here is the official Star Wars explanation. The firing of the Starkiller weapon is specifically engineered through space-time bending quintessential physics. I definitely said that word correctly to be seen across the galaxy as a horrifying example of the First Order's might. So, the First Order not only built a super laser planet, but they figured out a way to bend space-time so that everybody on every planet could see them blow up the Hosnian system. That... <laughs> that doesn't that seem unnecessary? Like, they went to their engineers and they went look it's not enough for us to blow up this planet we need everybody to see it and if i'm an engineer i go well why don't we like take a video camera and we'll get a video of it and then we can send the video to everybody or a hologram or whatever because it's star wars and they're going no i want them to see it as it happens live i need you guys to figure out how to bend space time so that people in other galaxies or sections of the galaxy can see our laser. What? That makes no fucking sense whatsoever. This is their, their same explanation for how it was able to target planets that aren't near it. Is that you can send a laser into hyperspace, have it pop out of hyperspace somewhere else, and blow stuff up there. Uh, okay, so so they didn't need to build their planet near other planets because you could just send lasers through hyperspace now. Sure, fine. There's no mention of this in the movie. That would have been such an easy thing to explain if it was actually what J.J. Abrams intended and not some sort of weird afterthought where now they're like, shit, how come they can see the laser? Just say it's because it's going through hyperspace, which bends time and then everybody can see it. Uh, this this feels a bit thrown together. I don't buy it, but fine. Pablo Hidalgo with the first major retcon. Lasers through hyperspace, bending time. So when you're hanging out at Maz Kanata's cantina, you get to see a laser light show. Okay, whatever. Number two, Finn is not a hero. Now, some parts of this book seem to be little footnotes that try to strengthen the awful themes of the movies that were never properly explained. For instance, in The Last Jedi, the theme was that Finn has to develop a duty to the Resistance. He, you know, he needs to learn duty, which makes no sense, because in the last movie, 
He he risked his life with Han Solo to help blow up Star Killer Base. He should be a resistance hero already. Thankfully, we have the book to make a little apologies for Ryan Johnson. Finn's role in destroying the Star Killer was incidental to his true loyalty. It didn't count. He only went there to save Rey. <laughs> Look, like I know that's what Ryan Johnson wants us to think, even though it doesn't make any sense. But the fact that they specifically had to put something in the book about it, like, don't think that Finn was being selfless when he risked his life to destroy the weapon that was going to blow up the Resistance planet. No, 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 that doesn't count. He was only there for Rey. He's not really a Resistance hero yet. The only way to become a true Resistance hero is to try and drive a plane into a laser and have your Asian girlfriend knock you out of the sky. That's the only way that it counts. Whatever. Number three, Holdo's secret plan. Oh, Holdo's plan. The plan. The secret plan that we never found out. We never knew why. We were like, why, Holdo? Why is it a secret? Okay, her plan was we're going to put everybody on tiny little transport ships. Send them to the salt planet. That was her secret plan. But she couldn't tell anybody. Why? Well, it's not because she's an incompetent leader who can't recognize when one of her you know, frickin' chief pilots is about to inspire a mutiny. No, 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 it's because she kept it a secret for operational security reasons. Well, there you go. You can't argue with that, it's in the book. Next time somebody says, why didn't she tell Poe the plan? You have an answer, you go, operational security reasons. Oh, God. Number four, explaining the Holdo maneuver. Now, they do attempt to, to touch on the Holdo Maneuver, which I find it hilarious that they now officially recognize it as the Holdo Maneuver, which to me raises so many more questions. Because again, calling it the Holdo Maneuver reinforces this idea that she's the first person to ever do it. Because otherwise, you would call it something else. You would name it after the guy who did it a thousand years ago. But instead, they've, they've confirmed. No one else has ever thought to slam a hyperspaced ship into another ship. She's the only one who ever did it to the point that we've now named it after her. The resistance takes to calling Holdo's unconventional but effective sacrifice the Holdo Maneuver. No, don't, don't make that canon. And they have an explanation for it of what she did. She perfectly timed a devastating point blank, blank hyperspace jump causing it to intersect the mass of the supremacy at light speed before entering hyperspace. Okay. So so we have confirmed that no, you can't just hyperspace through stuff. You have to time it in a way that before you enter hyperspace, you hit them, you could screw it. And so okay. Maybe the first time somebody tries to do that through pilot skill alone, yeah, it's probably pretty pretty hard to pull off i agree she 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 definitely uh was able to make some sort of miraculous thing that could never be replicated except it can okay you live in the star wars universe where we've established that science exists that you can find a way to send lasers through hyperspace and bend time so everyone gets to see the laser so now what are you going to tell me that there's no engineer anywhere who can sit down and crunch the numbers and be like, wow, that Holdo maneuver is very effective. Let's figure out a way to effectively replicate that on a consistent basis. Let's just do the math. Study the distance between target A, target B, and the power of the hyperspace drive. Plug it into the computer. Like you could now build this into a weapon. Just find an engineer and he can build it for you. You can't have this explanation like, oh, it's a one in a million shot. We need to put some Holdo maneuvers. Do some real damage. Come on, that move is one in a million. One in a million without the help of a targeting computer that is built to make these kind of hyperspace missile explosions. Okay? It's a bad explanation. You shouldn't have gave it this name, the Holdo Maneuver. <laughs> I mean, you had to figure out something to do with it. I don't think this was the correct way of trying to explain it. Number five, what's in the pouch? Okay, so one of, one of the big jokes has always been about J.J. Abrams' little mystery bugs, that he doesn't have any idea where they're going, which was the, the problem with the trilogy, is that 
J.J. Abrams would be like, here's a thing! And we'd go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Can you explain why that thing is there? And he'll go, not yet. You'll find out later. And then we get to the end of the trilogy. Half that shit he did, never. we never got an answer. Half the visions Ray saw and the people she met, you're like, who are these? What is all this? J.J. Abrams, we didn't have enough time to answer it all. One of the most obvious things is... Why does Maz Kanata have, have Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber? Why? Why does she have it? Who gave it to her? Why'd she put it in a box? Why when you down in her little basement, when you touch it, why do you see stuff? What is that? What does that mean? And for some reason, the book, it can't, it can't decide if it wants to give an answer or not. First it goes, Maz promises to someday tell the story of how she acquired it. Oh, thank you, book. Why don't you tell it now? Now that you have a book with all this little information, how about you tell me now? Where'd you get that? A good question for another time. Instead, the book's like, you don't need to you don't need to know about that. Hey, would you like to know what's in Maskinata's little pouch? She's got candy in it. What? I don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, in her in her pouch there's candy. It's not important. It's not helpful, Star Wars book. Tell me where she got the freaking lightsaber. That's what we want to know. I don't need to know that this, this old weird alien lady has a bunch of Werther's originals in her little side pouch that doesn't help me. Then later on, we, we they do touch on it a little bit. Uh, it was thought lost in Cloud City. It was salvaged from the mining colony's industrial depths. So as far as I can tell, the official explanation is it fell a lot, but then somebody found it. That's it. You drop that lightsaber off the Empire uh, State Building. It's not going to land intact. But somehow, it landed. Somebody found it. And, I don't know, pawned it off. Again, eventually, Maz Kanata found it at a pawn shop, just chilling. Great. I'm glad. I'm glad. That's the explanation. No no magic connection to the Force. It called out to somebody and they've... No, 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 no. Just somebody found it. Also, Maz Kanata has candy or a little bag. <laughs> this fucking book is ridiculous. Number six, Ray is a filthy thief. Oh, I also love this little bit about... <laughs> this is just so stupid. Uh, when Luke rejects his old lightsaber, Ray's scavenger instinct caused her to retrieve it and claim it as her own. <laughs> I love this little bit. That Ray is such a little, little uh, grubby-handed scavenger. That Luke throws the lightsaber and she goes, oh, free shit. And she grabs it. She's like, without, it's not that like she takes it because it's important to her or the quest. It was her scavenger instinct that said, yo, free lightsaber, yoink. Like, <laughs> I love it. Number seven, Ray learns to fly. All right, now this is what I think is probably the stupidest thing in the whole book. And it's kind of what inspired me to make this video uh, to begin with. Because again, this is not something that J.J. Abrams ever thought about when he was writing this movie. Because he didn't think when he was writing this movie. Okay? He, he, he did not plan it out, and now he has these guys struggling to fill the gaps. One of the most baffling things about The Force Awakens was Rey's incredible piloting skills. She goes from a girl, a dirt scavenger on a nowhere planet. Yeah, okay, she can, she has a little speeder bike, fine. But that's like saying that being able to ride a motorcycle then qualifies you to fly an F-14 fighter. They're different skills. <laughs> and yet, the second she gets in the Millennium Falcon, she is one of the best pilots we've may maybe ever seen in Star Wars. Narrowly fitting through little crevices and whatever else and you go how can she pilot like this what is the possible explanation even in the movie ray goes i don't know how did you do that i don't know no I've one the ships, but i've never no left one? the planet we all assumed i don't know maybe it's something to do with the force maybe she's related to han solo so she's innately a good pilot like what is the explanation well here it is and it's ridiculous uh ray reactivated while well, while living on Jakku the long dormant flight simulators on destroyed star destroyers Wh what what 
that what? Uh, there's so much there. Okay, first of all, you're telling me a Star Destroyer can crash land on a planet and still have enough power. N not only are the flight simulators working perfectly. Look, this thing's at an angle. If you sit in the flight uh, simulator chair, aren't you tilted the whole time trying to run the flight simulator? Okay. So she would get in these tilted ass chairs and she learned to pilot at a 45 degree angle, apparently. Just, she would just sit in there, boot it up, and play X Wing versus TIE Fighter all day long. And that's where she learned to pilot. And again, this is nonsense. Okay, because if that was true, she wouldn't have been so amazed at her own skills. When Finn goes, how do you pilot? How'd you do that? She wouldn't have been like, I don't know. Oh my God. She would have been like, oh wow, I don't know. I have, I have a little bit of flight simulator training. She would have said something like that. It wouldn't have, clearly JJ was trying to make it sound like this was some sort of weird force ability she had to be an incredible pilot. But then that didn't make sense because she ended up being Palpatine's granddaughter and he's not a pilot. So they're like... I don't know. She trained in a flight simulator somewhere. Uh, what? So ridiculous. I don't buy it. And that, that, come on. This is nonsense. Number eight, Senator Leia goes bye bye. Now, another big question we all had was why is Leia not like in charge of the Republic? You know, what, ha why is she not running the Senate or something? Instead, she's just still running what is basically the Rebel Alliance, which shouldn't even exist anymore. Okay, they won the war, they're in charge. She should be a senator. And here's the explanation for that. She was ousted from the Senate by the revelation that Darth Vader was her father. What? Uh, okay. Is that really so scandalous in this universe? Like, does, does this universe not understand that someone who literally never met their father probably wasn't influenced by him in any way like literally she was basically adopted at birth like oh but you're related to that evil guy oh that's cool hey you know who else was related to the evil guy the hero of our entire freaking republic luke skywalker who is a legend whose whose legend is passed around the universe okay where people on distant planets go luke skywalker I thought he was a myth. Are, do people not know that Darth Vader was Luke's dad? Couldn't that be something Leia could bring up? Like, hi, I know you guys want to fire me from the Senate because Darth Vader's my father. I'd like to bring up that our greatest hero who uh, blew up the Death Star and killed Darth Vader, as far as we know, killed the Emperor. Hey, uh, interesting tidbit about him. Darth Vader was also his father. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe not a good reason to kick me out. Again, it's not mentioned in the movies. I really don't think J.J. Abrams ever thought about any of this. But okay, that's the explanation. Number nine, the magic dagger of Gandar. This knife makes no sense. The magic knife. We have no idea who made it. We don't even know why they made it. It's not even like the knife takes you to Exegol. The knife tells you where to find the thing to get to Exegol. It's so weird. And the knife must have been created in the last 30 years because you have to hold it up to the Death Star, which only blew up 30 years ago. And then it finds the way. It's so confusing. It has writing on it that tells you what planet to go to. And it has a little, little dip to come out to point at what the thing is, though it doesn't tell you where to stand or what you're trying to do with that little thing. You just kind of have to figure it out. Okay, the Death Star is on an ocean planet, ocean moon of Endor, Kef Beer or whatever. It's being pelted by waves. Why would you build a thing, a knife, that perfectly lines up with a piece of wreckage when that wreckage, isn't it gonna erode and fall apart? How long is this knife useful for? And okay, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe the Death Star is made of some incredible metal that just like, does not deteriorate. And the only damage you see here is all of that happened from when it fell out of space, but the ocean doesn't actually affect it. Fucking nope. The book very clearly says, pelted by angry oceans for decades, the Death Star ruins are badly eroded. Yeah, it's eroding. This knife wouldn't work. 
you know, one big wave hits that section and your magic knife is no longer useful. It says here it's rotting, being eaten away by salt water. Debris is washing up on the coast. Uh, this this secret knife with the perfect little little wave what it doesn't make sense. It's so stupid. Why don't you just have the knife have like a tracking beacon or something in it? It would make way more sense than this nonsense. You hold it up. You just magically stand in the right place. You hold it up. Oh, it's in there. I figured it out. I you I figured it out. I did it. It makes no fucking sense. Number 10, all about that Palpatine. Now, probably the biggest questions in the book are going to be about Palpatine, right? How did Palpatine survive when the Death Star exploded? He was he fell into the core. He should be dead. Why is he a crane game holding him up now and moving him around? What is going on? What was his plan? Like, what does he really want? Like, there's so many questions about Palpatine, and the book does an incredible job of answering them. Let's take a look. Okay, this is Chapter 8, The Final Battle, where we're going to learn what Palpatine was planning. Okay, here's his TIE Fighters. Okay, that's interesting, I guess. Here's what his red Sith Trooper looks like. Cool. Don't... Okay, I don't really need to see what the red Troopers... Here's who the Sith Fleet personnel are. Everybody who's participating in the battle. Okay, a lot of... A lot of Star Destroyers there. Where's... Can I see Palpatine, though? What was Palpatine's... Pl Wait, Chapter 9, Behind the Scenes. But the final... The, the final battle and the, the dyad in the forest and... Where's Palpatine... Where's Palpatine's plan and his plan changed? He was... He was going to take over Rey and then he decided instead he was going to take over the dot. Where... What? 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 The, the book... Doesn't say anything about Palpatine. All these giant, glossy, full-color images of every minor character and their and their secret hopes and fears and everything. We learn more about Dengar <laughs> than we do the Emperor from this book. There is more to be said about what Dengar was up to than the frickin' central villain of the whole book. If you don't believe me, go on Amazon. Look at these reviews. No Palpatine. What? No Palpatine. Where is the information on Palpatine? This guy has a whole laundry list. The Loyalist, Snoke clones, Dark Ray and her double-bladed lightsaber, Ben Solo, Force healing, Dyads in the Force, Leia's training. None of this is covered. Or if it is covered, it is covered in the most superficial way. And remind you, this is the official Rise of Skywalker visual companion. It is supposed to tell us everything about Rise of Skywalker. But you know why they don't tell you everything? Because they don't know. This is my theory. Is that, you remember how they kept cutting this movie up until the last minute? I think Pablo Hidalgo had chapters on Palpatine. He had stuff about the Dyad, all this stuff. And they changed too much of the movie before it released that they're like just we have to get the book out in time for christmas so just everything that doesn't fit the movie we don't have time to rewrite it just drop it palpatine's not in the book because we don't really know what was going on because up until the last fucking minute we were reshooting scenes to try and explain his plan and the dyad and all this nonsense that's the funniest thing of all that the rise of skywalker visual companion doesn't know what was going on in Rise of Skywalker because the story team has not had time to sort out all this nonsense. The story team, the Lucasfilm story team, is looking at Rey and uh, Kylo kissing and they're going, Oh, God, how do we explain that? What does that mean? Anyway, if you want a good laugh at uh, all the, the wild attempts to try and fix the Star Wars universe at the last minute, <laughs> Uh, I recommend checking out the visual dictionary. It is it is a trip. It is a trip. And again, I don't even blame this guy, Pablo Hidalgo, and the rest of the story team. They had to sit down and look at these crappy movies and be like, oh God. Oh God, I have no idea. Uh, Ray, Ray learned to pilot from Star Destroyer Flight Simulators. Just put it in the book. Nothing makes any sense. 
Oh, it's insane. We're going to have more cool videos coming soon. Please like and subscribe down below. And of course, my, my Big Rise of Skywalker review. I'm working on it. Hopefully, it'll be out next month. Peace and love in 2020. Take care of yourself. And uh, don't ask questions about where Luke's lightsaber came from. Uh, just, just think about Maz Kanata and her hard candy. Her little pouch of Jolly Ranchers. That's what's truly important.